and welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Alexandra Paul, and I'm here with my wonderful co-host, Dotsie Bausch. Hi, Dotsie. Hello, everyone. So I, today, before we get into our guest, I want to talk a little bit about your athlete power plate, because a lot of people just get really confused about what to eat, what not to eat, and you, you and Switch for Good have devised this really beautiful plate mm -hmm. that makes it easy for people to kind of get an idea of how much we should have of each. Yeah. And the, the cool thing really is it's a it's an athlete power plate, but it's also just like a human power plate. It, it could be a dog power plate or a uh, rabbit <laughs> power plate. I mean, it really is uh, filled and we focus on the micronutrients, right? So all the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants that are in food, um, not just the macros, which are obviously carbohydrates, um, proteins, and fats. But is this a plate we, that people should try and get in their meals? Like that it should sort of look like that. Each I think meal? so. I mean, yeah. that's why we made it so delicious looking. Uh, really, this stemmed from uh, a desire to create a plate that nutritionists or dietitians could use with their clients, specifically their, their athlete clients, um, to help them plan their meals for the day. The U.S. Olympic Committee has what they call um, an athlete plate. And, uh, you know, obviously it's filled with lots of dead things. And so we had some nutritionists come to us at Switch for Good and say, can you please create a plant-based, a whole food plant-based power plate that I can help my plant-based clients uh, with their with their, with their meal planning. So we did just that, and we specifically wanted to make the foods, um, because foods that are alive are gorgeous, right? They're full of color. They're full of pigment. I mean, you just are... You, I really wanted people to salivate when they looked at this plate. If you go to switchforgood.org, there's a pop-up, and if you sign it for our newsletter, then it comes right to your inbox, and you can download it. But um, So it is broken up in carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, because that's what people are used to looking at. Um, but on the plate, we also have um, the, the pictures of the food, the descriptions of what those foods are. And then on the back of the plate, um, you have a, a real, um, you know, sort of every single food that's under carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and uh, including um, the micronutrients and superfood boost. And it's, it's really kind of like a, a one-stop plate. So it looks basically like half your plate uh, should be filled with carbohydrates. So sorry, keto people and your low-carb people. <laughs> but uh, for optimum health and activity, then having a plate that's 50% full of carbohydrates, fruit, vegetables, mm -hmm. grains is awesome. And then about 35% protein uh, at at most, right? At most, right? At most, because I think I only twenty five percent. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. but the, yep. this is for athletes. So, and then about what fifteen percent fat. So, right, ten or fifteen percent. Uh, and what's cool is it has some really neat info. It's so, it says here the average plant food has sixty four times more antioxidant content than animal foods. Yeah, boom. Yeah, because. <laughs> Everyone's so obsessed with protein. Right. Uh, they forget about the fact that antioxidants and phytonutrients are very important too. And that's what that's where plants and fruits yeah. and vegetables. That's where the real workhorses of repair and recovery come in. Yeah. For the athletes yeah. and anyone. But if you are obsessed about protein, uh, hemp seeds contain more protein ounce per ounce than meat. Yeah. So. Another, yeah. High five. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So Delish. this is a really great great thing and if people sign up at switchforgood.org to get the newsletter which is also uh, really informative you'll also get the athlete power plate that you can kind of tailor to your own activity exactly level. sure mm -hmm. great yeah Excellent. yeah okay i want to tell everyone about our guest <laughs> you know how excited i am uh so our guest today um is ashley bell she has a number of well-known acting credits under her belt, but perhaps her most iconic is that of Nell Sweeter in The Last Exorcism. I'm happy to report she's far more pleasant in person so far anyway. <laughs> That's because she's a really good actress. I mean, I saw a clip of her in something called Psychopaths, and I was just blown away as a psychopath. But you all will see how sweet she is. So anyway, she's a very good actress. Go ahead, Dazi. <laughs> yeah, no, I want to, you have to send me that clip because you guys were talking about it earlier and I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so she's evolved though, very much so from that possessed farm girl <laughs> to perform in everything from the Smurfs to love and air sex, a romantic comedy, uh, and others. But in 2008, she hit the height of her career, in my humble opinion anyway, when she wrote and directed Love and Bananas, An Elephant Story. 
It's a documentary chronicling the 480 mile. I can't even make it through this intro, Alexandra, without crying. <laughs> oh. want... Okay, I can do this. Uh, I just watched it two nights ago, so I'm, I'm, I'm still verklempt and very affected. Um, this documentary chronicles a 480 mile journey of a 70 year old Asian elephant known as No Na out of slavery in the trekking industry to an elephant sanctuary run by an exquisite compassion warrior named Lek. Ashley combines her platform as an actress with her passion for animal activism, obviously, and we can't wait to see what she has in the works next. So thank you so much, Ashley, and welcome to our podcast. I'm going to try to keep Thanks. a dry eye here. <laughs> yeah, we both we both watched your documentary, Love and Bananas, um, over the weekend and were just very, very moved by it. Yeah, it for one hour and 10 minutes, which is the length of this documentary, I sobbed, uh, sometimes uncontrollably, uh, sometimes just kind of quietly. But I was completely and totally taken and entranced by the story and how you told it, uh, the openness, um, learning about how we use these wild beings in slavery for our own needs and, and humor and kicks, right? Like shits and giggles, riding yes. them. Um, and the film, it's, I think it was so emotional because I was just taken on such a ride back and forth from its heartbreak and then hope and agony and triumph and evil and, and goodness and terror and compassion. Right. And, and it, it, I could go on and on. So thank you, first of all, for making this film. Which play, it's just playing on stars, right? Yes, it is currently available on stars and on iTunes. You can download it on iTunes or like YouTube download or Amazon download. But yeah, we are streaming on stars. Okay, good. Because I everybody, mm. if everybody on the planet is going to see this, they have to know where to go to see it. So thank you for that. <laughs> we'll mention those a few other times too. But oh man, I'd love if you could just start with telling our listeners um what drew you in so deeply uh, to tell this story and bring it to life? Sure, of course. Um, I just, first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much for having me. And uh, I was sitting listening to your intro about the athlete's power plate. And, you know, it's it reminds me so much of, of that protein question you get asked as a vegan or a vegetarian, where you get your protein and I'm always reminded having done a documentary about elephants, which are literally the world's biggest vegans. It's the story that kind of hits you and, and grabs, grabs you to your core. And um, I found that when I met world-renowned Asian elephant conservationist Lech Chyler. And I thought the original story was just going to be this very happily ever after release of two captive elephants. And when I saw the situation these elephants were actually living under in, in the heart of Cambodia, how they'd just been rescued, and it wasn't victorious. It was quiet and sad. These elephants were dehydrated and malnourished. The forest was, being, was on fire. You could hear trees getting cut down. And I saw Lek through it all, rehabilitating these elephants and, and taking them literally on their first walk of freedom. And Lex showed me on her iPad, which she takes with her wherever she goes for protection so she can film what's happening to her. She showed me their rescue on her iPad. You just load them in the back of a truck and you, she took them over stretches of highway and on a ferry and then off a ferry. And, and I looked at this and I'd never seen anything as harrowing and as hopeful and victorious. And, you know, I was born and raised a vegetarian. And in the animal community, you know, at least from what I've seen and, and having been raised in it, there's a lot of content that's very hard to watch or a lot of times where you feel like there's never going to there's never a happy ending or a happy ending is rare. And I saw Lek working with these elephants and it was filled with such hope. And I said that, that's the story. And I think there's a way to tell a documentary that is just about one elephant and that has this spirit of hope and love that, that takes us on this rescue. Um, and I asked Lek if I could go on a rescue with her. And she said, if you can 
hang, you can come. And It took two and a half years for her to call you, right? Uh, to say, hey, I have a rescue that I'd like you to document. It did. It took two and a half years with several false starts. Several elephants had become available. And then by the time I mean, we were moving fast, but in a day, they'd been sold to a circus, or in a day, they'd been sold out to a trekking camp. So um, it, it took us a week to get on a plane and get to uh, get to Thailand. Um, uh, literally, just enough time to buy insurance, and plane tickets, <laughs> and you know, in in the plane on the way from on the way to Thailand, it, we just were all praying that the the elephant was was still available to be rescued, um, that, that she didn't escape by the time we'd landed, can you we, know, or, or be sold off by the time we landed. Right. Can we, can you give us an overview of elephants in the world? There was a graphic in the beginning of your film and I, I realized how little I knew about elephants when I saw that graphic of, uh, what kinds there are and how many there are. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So a lot of people don't know that there are that there are, I mean, mainly two different kinds of elephants, African elephants and Asian elephants. And they're two different species. You can't put them together. Um, Play for an African elephant is just a total threat for an Asian elephant. So Mm -hmm. on Earth right now, there are about 400,000 African elephants but only 40,000 Asian elephants, and a third of those Asian elephants are in captivity. Um, The numbers make Asian elephants the endangered of the two. But uh, a lot of people aren't aware that they're, they're, mm, I don't want to use the word extinction, but that they're so rapidly declining and that there are so few of them. of the two, Asian elephants are the ones we're most familiar with in the States because Asian elephants, due to their temperament, are more, quote unquote, docile after they've been through um, a, cr- a crush a crush box or a crush box type uh, training, which um, kind of uh, takes the wild out of them. Um, through abuse, which is the the small amount of graphic footage we show in the film. But Asian elephants are the elephants you'll see in zoos and circuses, and you'll ride. If you do participate in an elephant ride, Asian elephants will be the ones you'll, you'll ride. I think there are very, very few, like less than five African elephant camps where you can ride African elephants because of their personality type. So if you've had an encounter with an elephant, it, it's normally an Asian elephant. But so was there's 450,000 African elephants and only about 45,000 Asian elephants, which is putting them in the near extinction category. Is that what I remember seeing that in the film? Yeah. Yes, that is. Yeah, and it's yeah, no. it's sad. It was 40, 450,000. I believe it's now 40,000 African elephants. So just from the short amount Whoa. of just from the the 2 to 3 years we've done the anim, the animation, the numbers dropped significantly. Cuz they get them for their tu- uh, tusks, mostly the African tusks. elephants, right? Yes, in Africa those elephants are poached for their tusks for ivory primarily. It also is the human elephant conflict, um, mm. which is, you know, elephants will, elephants are considered beloved to us, but pests to um, a lot of people. Um, because, for instance, if you're a farmer and you have a plot of land and that's your livelihood for the year, an elephant who's hungry and rummaging around and that's in his migratory path, uh, sees dinner and they eat a a lot of food. So they go into that farm and they, they eat it all up in, in an hour. Um, and that's that, that's that farmer's whole livelihood. So now what you have, and, um, through this whole process, I've been so fortunate to meet, uh, biologists that are working on human elephant, um, Uh, human elephant conflict solutions to be able to show Mm cruelty-free solutions and teach education um, to not kill elephants, but work with them or alert people that can help herd them back out into 
into the wild, um, not not kill them, um, and use pretty humane methods to uh, um, to deter them from from eating up your farm. Uh, a big one, for instance, in Africa. Fun fact: I, you guys might know this, but um, elephants elephants don't like bees. <laughs> Um, so what they found, if, if they put like a sack of honey, uh, a bee pouch of honey and pollen, um, the elephants will smell that and it'll smell like bees and the elephants will stay completely away from that farm because these, these pouches hang. So they're, they're great elephant de- deterrents and it's elephants don't die in the process. Yeah. That's so interesting. I didn't know that. And um, I I knew that they were hunted for their tusks. In fact, I think there's some elephants that are being, or am I thinking of rhinos, that are being born without tusks because of those are the only ones that survive. There's more elephants coming up that have no tusks from genetic survival of the fittest kind of thing because of all the... um, killing of the ones with the biggest tusks. Right. Um, Another fun fact to keep the bees alive, because as we know, they're important too. Um, my husband is petrified of bees, and so they tend to like to lay nest on our house um, <laughs> to greet him. And, you know, I'm not going to get an exterminator. So um, I, I learned from a, a sanctuary owner, they don't like uh, eu- eucalyptus or lemon. So you put a put the essential oil around your, your doorways in your house, and they, they just pick somewhere else. Oh. Because they don't like those two smells. That's it's like a, the elephants don't like them. That's a great fun fact for those of anyway. us here in L.A. Um, I would like you to, you mentioned the crush box. Yes. That was, I know you made sure that your documentary didn't uh, contain a lot of uh, violence because you knew that uh, audiences don't want to see that. But you did show a little bit of the crush box, which was devastating to see. Can you explain, though, just because I think we all need to know yeah. why, yes. why we need it in the first place. And how, how this works and why there are elephants who are able to perform in circuses because they have not only been tamed but broken. So what happens is elephants are taken from their mothers as babies and they're put in um, a wooden box and they're tied up with all four legs and they're beat straight for 24 hours for a week until the bond between the baby and the mother is broken and replaced by the fear of man or the bull hook or whatever tool man is using. If it doesn't work the first time, it's repeated again until it works. Um, And we show just as much as we need to of this footage. I think it's like under 10 seconds. Um, Our goal in making the film was to make a film that could be watched and that people could hear and learn and feel empowered by what they can do to help animals, no matter where they are in the world. And we didn't want to flood it with graphic content because we wanted the audience to keep their eyes and ears open to get the message um, and to feel empowered, which is what Lek does, you know, uh, em- empowers her elephants again and empowers people that go to, to visit her. But that is the crush box um, situation. Yeah. I didn't realize that elephants, they're not only used here in the States, we only think of them as as seeing them in zoos or in circuses, but um, in Asia, they're often used to haul logs and they're actual work horses in a sense. Deep in the jungle, you can't get a a huge tractor to pull a mahogany teak or rubber tree. They use elephants. Um, And it's... uh, it's, it's interesting because a lot of these countries have banned logging in, in an attempt to save their forest. Still, illegal logging will happen in kind of, will still happen in deep jungle. So elephants will still be used for logging. But if logging has been banned, those elephants have still gone through the crush and they're very expensive to maintain. So what owners will do is they'll sell off their elephants to trekking camp for rides or zoos or circuses in order to still continue to make a profit. Mm-hmm. What are these rides like? What are these trekking camps? What, what, if, for tourists, what happens there for the tourist? It's like the best kept secret. So uh, people will go and, and elephants will, will, after the crush, they'll go into a training camp where they'll be taught you know, how to wear a harness, and um, they'll wear this harness uh, that's kind of like a, 
a, a, a basket essentially and tourists will climb in there and they'll go on an elephant ride and a lot of tourists have described it as being miserable they felt the elephant felt miserable mm -hmm. but what's so what's so interesting is that you know it's just when you know better you do better you know a lot of people say oh i love elephants i want to ride one that's on my bucket list but they because that's all they know they don't know elephants have been subjugated to this what's interesting is that in northern thailand in chiang mai where elephant nature park is the concert the um the sanctuary that Lek Chyler runs, it's the number one tourist destination in Northern Thailand. People want to go and just be with elephants. Uh, and when you go to Elephant Nature Park, Lek calls it, you, you work for the elephant. So you cut sugar cane and you cut corn and every elephant has a special menu because of their dietary restrictions because they either have a sensitive gut or no teeth or whatever. So you'll, you'll cut watermelon or you'll make tamarind balls or you'll make rice balls and you work for the elephant. Um, sometimes you can bathe them and give them a, a mud bath uh, for their skin. And people love going to a true sanctuary like this. Um, spoiler alert, what you see in the film is Lex, Lex's biggest goal now is taking trekking camps and showing if you turn them into a humane sanctuary you'll make just as much money, if not more, being a humane sanctuary and attract your audience, if not a larger audience. And since filming, 19 camps have turned into humane sanctuaries, which means tons of elephants are, you know, Lex says, look, I only care about that elephant's well-being at the end of the day. If it's, you know, I understand money. If it's money for you, fine. But that elephant doesn't have to wear a, doesn't have to trek when it's pregnant, doesn't have to work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, doesn't have to work in the heat, can be properly hydrated and drink water and live a humane life. And you can still get your financial gain. And in so fact, I, it, you have a very moving sequence where the owner of the trekking camp from which you get, Nonai, is, uh, does turn his trekking camp into a sanctuary and makes more money than he does having had that trekking camp. Yes. Spoiler alert. I'm sorry, yeah. but <laughs> it's okay. Even when people know, I mean, I knew quite a bit about your film before I saw it. So, and it was still amazing, but it's so, it was so moving to see that, that scene where he was seeing the elephants through. I know. It's almost oh, through Lex's eyes, like she yeah. sh shared her eyes with him and her heart. And as they and were individuals mm -hmm. and not just, f um, yeah. you know, objects Income. for his. Yeah. yeah. So and that was very moving. He called that scene in the edit the miracle factor because we had absolutely no clue that was going to happen on the day of filming. We met Noina and we were ready for her to be loaded into the truck. And Lex said, you know, come quick come quick, we're going to go on a jungle walk. And we were kind of lumbering along, and she's like, come on, come quick, it's a jungle walk. And we're like, what's a, what's a jungle walk? And lo and behold, these elephants that had been chained their entire life, who were, I mean, there's nothing's cut from the film. What you see is <laughs> 30 minutes after you see them rocking and bobbing in their enclosures chained, Lek had taken five elephants, not, not picked for any space, at random, and just remove their chains. And these elephants weren't rocking and bobbing. They weren't charging anyone. They weren't being aggressive. They were more curious in terms of if they were allowed to move. And they were more curious to start eating. They began breaking branches and walking faster. And only when we had, Lek was doing a fabulous job at translating, but only when we had uh, brought the footage to a translator did the translator pick up the word kids? And the owner had said, my, my kids, mm -hmm. I can't believe my kids are behaving this way. And we were getting this translated down at like a language door in Irvine. <laughs> and, and I remember just bursting out crying. I said, kids, oh my God. And he, he regarded them as individuals and he never knew. He just never 
knew that elephants could behave this way. Um, he was always terrified of them. And when they're put under that amount of stress, of course, they're, they're going to react aggressively, but not when they're left alone to be elephants, which is what Lek teaches and shares. And they didn't it's, run away? They didn't no. try and run away? They just were walking? No, sometimes they do, but... No. Sometimes. <laughs> but, but in this instance, they just walked and he trusted her. Yes, at this, in this instance, it, it, I saw this t- twice where when they were walking, it was like a halting walking because they weren't used to walking without chains and they probably weren't used to walking without being yelled at or, or controlled in some aggressive way. Um, when elephants are at the Cambodia Wildlife Sanctuary, when elephants were left to their own devices and are newly freed, sometimes as they're walking around, they do smell the depths of jungle and they just charge into the jungle. Just It's like a rapture. Mm-hmm. And they'll find them sometimes like a hundred miles out, but everybody just gets in the truck and just starts driving after them. Would they be able to survive if they did run away and stay in the jungle after 40 years of being chained and fed uh, and basically not being able to move or do anything natural? Sure. I suppose their survival instincts could kick in. What Lek does is in the rehabilitation of them, she she shows them their path and always shows them a way home because they're undernourished and they're dehydrated and they have illnesses. Um, so she has to give them deworming pills or drips or acupuncture sometimes mm-hmm. or make sure they're up to weight or make sure she's hydrating them in a certain way. Um, or if they're a landmine elephant, she's treating their foot. So they're elephants that aren't healthy enough to be free yet. Uh, what Lek is trying more and more to do is to create fully wild programs where a younger elephant or the healthiest elephants can go and be released into this wild enclosure and, and just let be. You know, it's, it's still enclo- miles and miles and miles are still enclosed just because of the human elephant conflict that happens in Thailand um, and throughout Southeast Asia and Africa, but they are left to their own devices to be elephants. You know, additionally, they're, they're a matriarchal, the mm-hmm. herd is matriarchal. Um, oftentimes, for instance, when young elephants give birth in zoos or are forced to give birth out of artificial breeding, that younger elephant hasn't been taught to be a mother. So oftentimes when it gives birth, it knows that baby is going to have the same fate it will have in a zoo, or that baby will be taken away from it to be put in another exhibit or for other monetary purposes. Um, and it's, it's horribly sad, but oftentimes that mother will, will kill its baby so it won't be subjugated to the same fate it has lived. Also because that young mother hasn't been taught mothering to raise that child. But in a herd, that's why you have the, you know, the moms, the grandmas, the super nannies, the aunt and aunties, you know, that come around because it mothering and survival and knowledge and food, water, where it's safe to go, where it's not safe to go, predators, all that information is passed down generationally. That's why an elephant never forgets. So, you know, while they could scavenge on their own in the wild, they they're not solitary, you know, creatures. Sometimes bulls are, but female elephants really are not solitary. They live in a matriarchal society. Yeah. That's what was just, I think, is the most extraordinary thing about um, non-human animals is um, their ability to learn to love and trust again. Or maybe it's instinctual because Noinas spent 70 years being beaten and starved and as a slave. And in the film, it's like within moments that yeah. she's trusting with you and Lek. 
and and you guys are sitting down, and there, the, there at this point, there's more elephants than just known on, that, and the the trunks are all over you guys. I mean, my husband was like, "I'd be so scared." It's sitting there. They're so big, and it's it's just this it's just this most extraordinary scene. But they're all rescued elephants, and I mean. I, I think after 70 years of that type of abuse, I, I, I can't imagine ever trusting again another human, another from whatever species was abusing me. And it, what was I, that I like? I still hold grudges from kindergarten. It's terrible. Right. <laughs> right. Thank you. <laughs> what, was, what, was, what was that like? What was that experience like with all of those elephants who had lived such long lives in slavery and then, and then experiencing their joy like that? Oh, my gosh. It was... It was remarkable, and I just was praying that no one would start peeing. <laughs> <laughs> they trust Leck. Leck is their mom, and I got a chance to have that seat because I was with her to think for a creature that, that never forgets how it's able to trust and love again. And, I mean, that's, it's nothing short of a miracle, the work. Lek does. Mm -hmm. And these elephants who have been, who are all rescued as individuals at Elephant Nature Park find families again. They find their herds again. There, I think, are three roving herds at Elephant Nature Park with, with generations in there. It's just remarkable. Yeah. What can people do who care about elephants? Uh, what can they do to help? When Lek has spoken, she talks about your mobile phone as a mobile sanctuary. So much of people saying, oh, I love elephants, I'm riding one next summer. You know, it's just lack of education. And when you travel, if, if you are fortunate enough to travel and exist with animals, travel humanely. It's 2019, we've passed the point of, of elephants being plentiful. They are endangered, you know, so when you travel, Make sure you do your research and travel humanely. Also, the information's out. Share, tweet, and post it. You know, as soon as even the trailer of Love and Bananas began circulating, people were like, what? I had no idea. And that's Leck putting her life on the line to get that footage. Just in, just in the same way that so many vegan activists filmed uh, undercover lab footage of cruelty-free testing and slaughterhouse footage that no one knew until they saw what was going on. Um, uh, so definitely spreading education that way. Um, if, you, uh, if you do want to donate, um, one of the things I'm most proud of was Love and Bananas for its release partnered with The Greater Good, which is a huge not-for-profit to launch the Love and Bananas Fund. And The Greater Good helped get the message of the film out in tons of theaters nationwide and they've even helped worldwide and they've set up a fund that targets that has lex list of the oldest and sickest elephants and they just go down that list and fundraise for elephants and last year the film came out so it was our first year up and running we were able to provide enough funds to save three individuals mm. uh and love and, and the love and bananas fund the greater good takes no additional fees they take no bank transaction fees no nothing so all of your money is going to to lack so i would have to say those those two raising awareness about those two um really globally can impact impact people when you're talking about um you know traveling um compassionately <clears throat> included yes. it would be um like I would imagine the same thing happens to camels. Like no camel rides is something we need to remember. Not watching um, monkeys on the you know sideshow zoos where you no pay swimming money. with dolphins. No swimming Don't with stay dolphins. in a hotel where they have any kind of dolphin swimming or even dolphins right, in captivity. Right, right. We just know that if they are there, these wild species were trained horrifically to be able to do this and entertain you and have. I'm getting ready to go to um, Morocco and and the friend that I'm I'm going with. I mean, neither one of us are interested or any of these things and she's been doing some research on um what we'll go and see and do and and she said Dotsie it's 
I can't. Almost all of the tourist things there have to do with live animals or dead animals. There's a lot of uh, camel rides. There's elephant rides. There's going to visit to tanneries. That's really popular. It, the, whole, the whole list of all the popular stuff. So we're going to do, of course, uh, cycling tours. Because God forbid we just get ourselves around people. Do we need I the animals? The to I mean, you know, just pedal yeah. a little bit. You can see. So we're going to do that. And I think Good that's it. You, but maybe maybe you could t- protest okay. outside some of those trekking camps. Alexander style. Thank you for the <laughs> challenge. I just might take you up on that. <laughs> When you're done with your Morocco trip, can you please do an op-ed for like travel and leisure or a cruelty-free <laughs> guide? Like that's a really good idea. Great idea. Great idea. Yes. Jossie, yes. She's a really good writer too. Guide to Morocco with pictures, and I think, please. <laughs> okay. Okay. If, that's great. The first person that does it, then oh, okay, then it makes sense. You know right. what I mean? You're right. You're um, right. I didn't just. I won't just keep this to myself. I'm yes, gonna write that down. Good. So what about in the United States? There are elephants in zoos and in circuses still. Um, there's about 17 circuses, that maybe a f- fewer, that are in the United States now that still use um, elephants. This, this was two, 2016 stats. And um, over 200 elephants exhibited in zoos in the United States. Oh. And I know here in Los Angeles we have four elephants at the L.A. Zoo. And there have been various campaigns, free Billy and such, but so far these elephants have remained there. And the zoo has basically said, well, we've improved no. the, se- the where they live and we've given them more trees or God knows what. But elephants need a big range to roam and be elephants. And so, of course, Dotsie and I and most of our guests and a lot of our listeners really feel like zoos and um, circuses are just Horrible, horrible places for any animal. Can you speak anything about what's going on in the United States in terms of elephants? I can. Yes. So another action item is a is a is a home a a, a stateside action item. Um, and thank you so so much for bringing that up. So there is a website called Zoo Check. I believe it's in covers Canada and the United States to check if your zoo is quote unquote actually humane. Um, in regards to elephants, can you I mean, ever have a zoo that's humane? I mean, to me, that's an oxymoron, though. It it is it is for me too, um, because with elephants, they need so much stimulation. They just are never going to, in my opinion, they're never going to get that in in a zoo. Um, in Los Angeles, the fight is still raging. It's been raging for, I guess, 16 years now to free Billy. There are protests every month um, that are more educational than, you know, nothing is confrontational. Um, they're there to educate, uh, to free Billy. Um, Cher and Lily Tomlin have been very vocal in putting their name to get uh, Billy out. David Castleman, the actually one of the executive producers on Love and Bananas, is a trial attorney that has taken the case to court to try to free Billy. And, you know, Billy was given acres of land that the zoo, um, the zoo hotwired all of the shrubbery, so Billy couldn't get to the actual shrubbery, so he only was left to go in his own enclosure area, not to actually forage off trees and then they didn't rototill the soil so when you're 8,000 pounds and when you're stomping around on your same plot of soil that's going to turn into concrete you know or an equivalent to concrete really fast and one of the number one deaths of elephants in captivity is um, cysts in in your feet uh, arthritis Mm -hmm. and becoming overweight for a wild, exotic animal. I mean, uh, so Billy is kept by himself. Then there are three other female, I believe three other female elephants, and they're kept to their selves as well, but they're exhibiting, it's been proven in a court of law, they're exhibiting severe stereotypic behavior, constant rocking and bobbing. Billy is overweight and has uh, arthritis and osteoporosis in his, jo- in his joints. Um, they're pushing very much now, and I believe it's, uh, I believe a, a bill is going to be, they're going to be voted on, or uh, I'll post about this. But um, 
uh, to free Billy and move him up to PAWS, which is, uh, again, a performing animal welfare society, I believe those, that's the full P-A-W-S, a completely humane sanctuary just up north in California. It won't be a 24-hour drive at all <laughs> to move him to this humane mm. sanctuary. And they've said, we open our doors to him whenever whenever they want him, uh, whenever they, they decide to free him. David Castleman also approved in a court in court that um, people only spend about three to four minutes in front of an elephant exhibit. That's it. They don't spend an hour there. And if elephants are removed from a zoo, their zoo's monetary yearly monetary income does not drop at all. There's no change in annual revenue if you remove the elephants from the exhibits. That's important so, information. Wow, yeah. There's also some, there are, there are sanctuaries here like Lex in Thailand. But also I read that Ringling Brothers and Barlin, there's a Barnum and Bailey Center for Elephant Conservation. Okay, so that just makes me <laughs> concerned right away that, that, that they are um, basically brainwashing us into thinking it's a sanctuary, but really it's not. Do, do you know any information on, on those Sanctuary, I know. quote unquote. You're a tried, a tried and true, a tried and true. Many years in the animal community, you're like <laughs> red, red alert, red <laughs> flag. Some question marks. Just some question marks in that phrasing. Um, what I've heard is while they have been removed from circuses, there is breeding going on. I cannot confirm that. No, that's exactly right. You're right. In the in the sanctuaries, okay. they don't allow breeding. Uh, Le- for the so most Lex part, sanctuary, there is absolutely no breeding. Lex sanctuary, there is no forced breeding and no breeding, none. But in these breeding camps, just just to clarify that for for yeah. anybody listening, um, you can rest assured there is no breeding or forced breeding going on there. But Alexandra, as you were just about to say, in these sanctuaries, there is or in these um, conservation centers, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it, it, the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Center for Elephant Conservation. You're right. That's exactly right. They allow them to breed, and then what do they do with those little babies? They then will give sell them to zoos. So, because Barnum and Bailey's over, right? Ringling Brothers is over, and Barnum and Bailey is too. I think they're both gone. So now they just had to figure yes. out how to make income. So they breed them and then sell them to zoos. Well, that's a that's a good point. Um, I don't know. I'll have to do some more research, and we'll talk about it on a future show. I'm creeped you, out. Ashley, do you have anything to add to that? Do you know anything about how many circuses there are now? Um, well, there are about 17, at least 17 Amer- American circuses that are using elephants. Yeah, just not those. Over 200 we elephants. We figure out which zoos. ones. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, that's that's all. Uh, I mean, thank you for that number. Um, no, that's that's mm-hmm. all. That's all I know, and uh, I'm more versed on the Billy on the Billy situation. Ashley, <laughs> you were um, vegetarian your whole life, uh, but yes, what I is was your? Based. Yes, okay. And so you you went a hundred percent plant based l- later on, or you you were since since birth. Since birth, but. Um, uh, at my house, it's always it's always vegan. If I'm traveling or in a in a if I, if I'm just traveling, occasionally I will I have eaten an egg, or um, that's been that's been it. Yeah, but there's no uh, I don't keep milk in the house or yogurt in the house or or anything anything like that. If I'm if I'm in a, a terrible bind, I'll eat something that's not 100% plant based. But right. yes. Right. So you're you're basically you're certainly vegan at home. <laughs> well, what was it like in Cambodia? I mean, how were you were you able to find vegan food? I was, yeah, I was, because you just you continue just to eat, you continue just to eat plants. Yeah. Um. So I was able to eat dark leafy greens. Yeah, dark leafy greens and noodles. That that was pretty much what I thrived on, and tons of fruit fresh fruit. And, uh, I was always on the brink of dehydration and I would drink a coconut. <laughs> I'm dead serious. 
<laughs> it looks really hot there in the film. <laughs> so I want to move away oh, from yeah. the film. I did, I did dehydrate once and I was only with a vet tech and she was so dear. She put me on the ground. And then as soon as I was starting to eat again, the first thing she gave to me was a banana. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Love Imagine it. that. Um, I want to move just, from... This elephant just gives me the side eye. <laughs> <laughs> I want to move from um, your wonderful documentary, Love and Bananas, which I hope so many of our viewers will yeah. now watch, um, because we haven't even gotten into the excitement, the action packed of actually transporting the 70 year old elephant to a sanctuary, which was so shot in such an exciting manner. And uh, it's just a beautiful film to watch yeah. overall. But you're an actress. You've been acting for a long time. You have many, many credits uh, under your belt. Do you ever uh, find that your values conflict as an as an animal advocate conflict with the, um, the the movies that you're doing or anything, and that you have to say no? Or how do you navigate that? I've I've been offered movies where, for example, I had to ride a horse. I personally don't don't believe in riding horses, and so I convinced the producers to. Change. I convinced them how expensive and difficult it's going to be to have a quote unquote stampede, which is what they wanted. <laughs> <laughs> and I convinced them that just riding a motorcycle was going to be quite it's all right. So much uh, my cooler. character could just ride a motorcycle. And that is what happened. As soon as I mentioned, like, how are you going to do the stampede thing? You know, I didn't even have to say, I don't believe in riding horses. I can't do that. I just had to give them the positive views of you know, rewriting that, those few scenes. <laughs> what um, you might look like on a Harley. <laughs> <laughs> Ding. <laughs> so have you ever encountered yeah, that kind of thing? Stampede equals money. <laughs> <laughs> having, having done, you know, some really interesting horror movies that I'm so proud of and, or genre movies and having worked with those teams, you know, that have made some classic films, the horror audiences are so smart. So, you know, I, I did a rewrite on one script and I, I really asked them to push it out. You, you know, you don't need to kill that kill and gut a deer. What is that saying about the character? What is that saying about the plot? What is that saying about the storyline? What else can you do that's more, what other manifestation of what this character is doing is more interesting than gutting a deer? Because the, the choice to gut that deer was just doing something brutal. And, and gross. And it's like, but what is, but what emotionally is that information giving the audience? And can you make a sharper, more dynamic choice in terms of gut wrenching the audience? And um, it, it was met with a lot of good, good feedback and the scene changed. So th Ashley, thank you so much for being on our show. Your documentary is amazing. Dotsie and I were so enriched by seeing it and we hope our audience will, will watch it too. Thank you so much. And I uh, will we'll have in the show notes how to get a hold of Ashley. And remember that you can see that yes, movie on, on Instagram and, and, and her website and Love and Bananas website and, and everything. So yeah. you can make sure that everybody on the planet sees, sees this film. It's That's so good. Right. Thank you so much. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future. <laughs>